Hello, thank you for joining me again for the next episode in All Things Aviation. Today we're going to be continuing our navigation series and we're going to be discussing the 60 to 1 rule. There's a couple applications of this rule and some of you may have heard of it, but if you're anything like me, you don't like just memorizing things, you like to understand how and why things work. So we're actually going to get into some of the math behind how the 60 to 1 rule works today as well. So to begin with, uh, what is the 60 to 1 rule? Basically it is a rule that pilots can use to quickly con convert in their head uh, and do some mathematical calculations in their head to determine good lead points to both enter an arc or leave an arc for a radial off of a navigational aid. Additionally, you can use this in calculating descents. And if you're at a given altitude and you want to descend to another given altitude, you want to do that within a certain amount of time, or rather, a certain amount of distance, uh, you can determine how far it'll take you to descend a given amount of um, altitude or what pitch you potentially need to pitch down to. The thing about the 60 to 1 rule is while a lot of pilots learn about the 60 to 1 rule while they're going through pilot training, they're not often taught the math behind how and why the 60 to 1 rule works, so we'll be discussing that today. Basically what the 60 to 1 rule allows pilots to do is calculate both lead points necessary to turn onto an arc or a radial, as well as calculate the distance necessary for a given descent. Okay, so one of the main times when you would use the 60 to 1 rule is when you're shooting an instrument approach as a pilot. So this is a very simplistic look at what an instrument approach might look like. Oftentimes you can get vectors onto the final approach segment of the instrument approach. In this case it would be a localizer and this is representing the localizer course extending off the threshold or runway. However, in a non-radar environment or potentially if you just want to practice a full procedure or for any number of other reasons as a pilot you may ask to do the full procedure. And that might look something like this. There might be a Mav-8, in this case I have a Vortac here, which works the same as a VOR, which I discussed in one of my previous lessons. You're coming from some place other than directly lined up with the runway, which is highly likely. You'll often intercept what's called an arc off of this nav -aid. And basically what that is, is, if you can imagine any number of radials extending off of this nav -aid, and you have distance measuring equipment, which will also tell you what distance you are from it. And so you'll arc at the 10 mile arc and basically you'll remain 10 miles from that nav aid and if you will fly a circle or a section of a circle off of that nav aid until you can then intercept the final approach segment of the course. So in this instance you might intercept the 10 mile arc off of the Vortac and arc around to intercept the localizer for a localizer approach to this runway. Now the thing is if you want to intercept the arc, but you're coming perpendicular to it, you can imagine in an aircraft you can't wait until the very moment you arrive at that arc to initialize your turn, or you'll fly right past it. So as pilots, what we want to do is determine a point, a certain distance from the nav aid, in which, at which to begin our turn in order to properly intercept the 10 mile arc. Additionally, if you're already established on the arc, it's important that you determine a radial at which to leave the arc prior to the radial you actually want to fly inbound on in order to properly intercept that radial. So in this instance, if the localizer were roughly equivalent to a 090 radial, the radial leaving the station at the 090, you would not want to wait until you're at the 090 to leave the arc, otherwise you may not properly intersect your final, intercept your final approach segment of the course. So that's one instance in which it's necessary to use the 60 to 1 rule. Another time when it's really important is for descent.
So using geometry, we can determine a given distance from the center of a circle at which one degree will equal one nautical mile of circumference. So using the formula 2 pi r equals c, or 2 times pi times the radius of the circle equals the circumference, we can determine what radius would give us one mile for one degree. Basically, if we had a circle with one degree equal one, equaling one mile, we know that the circumference of that circle would be 360 because there are 360 degrees in a circle. So if we plug that into the formula, we can basically take 360 divided by 6.28 and we find that the given radius for a circle where one degree equals one mile of circumference is 57.3 nautical miles. You might be saying that's great, but how does this help me as a pilot? And basically what this allows pilots to do is determine how many radials are in a given distance when you are a another given distance from the nav aid. So for example, if I'm 10 miles away from the nav aid, then using the 60 to 1 rule, we're going to round the 57.3 up to 60. I know that there are six radials for every one mile I travel. Likewise, if I'm 120 miles away from the center of the, or from the nav aid rather, or the center of the circle, then I know that there's half a radial per mile. Typically, we're not going to be ever arcing even 60 miles away, let alone 120. But 10 miles is common, and maybe out to about 15 or 20 is what I'd say I've seen, and I've seen as close as six. Uh, six uh, six uh, miles from the nav aid, obviously, they're going to be 10 radials per mile. Now, let's convert this into something we can use in the cockpit. There are various techniques out there, but the one I've found that I like that works best for me. So I like to take my ground speed in miles per minute. So for instance, if I'm traveling 180 knots ground speed, that's three miles a minute. I subtract from that 50 knots, giving me 130 knots. And I take 1% of that, so 1.3, and that's my lead point in miles. So if I am wanting to enter onto the arc from a radial, I know that when I'm 1.3 miles from the arcing distance, so in this case, if I was going to enter onto a 10 mile arc, I would need to begin my turn onto that arc at 11.3 DME or miles. Additionally, if I were arcing on a 10 DME arc, I know that there are six radials per mile. If I wanted to leave that arc for a given radial, I know that I would need to begin my turn when I were on the arc approximately eight arcs prior to the one I wanted to turn onto. And that's again at the 180 knots ground speed. Okay, let's talk about the 60 to 1 rule in regards to descents. This, I suppose, could be used for normal descents where the controllers will give you a new altitude and you're expected to descend to that altitude beginning immediately. However, where this will often come into play is what's known as pilot's discretion descents. Oftentimes, controllers will give pilots a descent that is not required to be initiated immediately. The pilot can begin their descent at their discretion as the name hints. However, oftentimes they must be at the new assigned altitude by a given location, or oftentimes this will be given to pilots as they're coming into their final destination where the controller knows they'll ultimately have to get down to shoot the approach and land at their point of destination. So, in this instance, if the, if the controller asks the pilot to send from a given altitude to a new altitude, and you want to calculate at what angle you need to pitch over to attain the new altitude within a cer certain distance, or what distance you want to, what distance will be required for a given pitch that you would like to pitch over at, oftentimes three degrees and those low is the chosen descent, then you need to have some way of figuring that out. And the 61 rule allows us to do that. And basically, this is how it works.
from trigonometry, we know that the tangent of an angle equals the opposite leg over the adjacent leg. So in this instance, if we wanted to determine the number of degrees necessary to pitch nose low in reference to level flight, to achieve a 100 feet per nautical mile, there's 6,076 feet per nautical mile, descent, we would take 100 divided by 6,076 and we get 0 0.0165. Therefore, if we take the inverse tangent of 0 0.0165, we determine that 0.95 degrees of pitch is necessary in order to attain 100 feet of descent for every one mile we travel in the horizontal. So obviously we could just round this up to one degree. Now in the aircraft, we don't have any way to measure descent per lateral distance, but what we can measure is descent in terms of time, and we use our VSI to do that, our vertical speed indicator. And that instrument will tell us the hundreds of feet we're descending or climbing per minute. And so what we need to do is figure out a way to convert hundreds of feet per mile into hundreds of feet per minute. So the easy way to do this is you determine how many miles per minute of ground speed you're traveling. And you multiply that times 100, and that'll give you the necessary hundreds of feet per minute descent to achieve hundreds of feet per mile. So if I was given a positive discretion descent, and my ideal descent was 3 degrees nose low, that would correlate to 300 feet of descent per one mile I travel laterally. I would then need to look at my ground speed and determine how many miles per minute I'm traveling. For this instance, let's say I'm traveling at 6 miles per minute. I would take that 6 miles per minute times my 300 feet per mile of descent, and that would give me my vertical speed necessary to be at the altitude using a 3 degree nose low attitude. So in this case, it would be 1,800 feet per minute would correlate to 300 feet per mile or my three degrees nose low that I desire. Additionally, let's pretend for a moment that I'm traveling at 24,000 feet. And the instrument approach that I want to shoot has me initially at 3,000 feet. That means I have 21,000 feet to lose. When I'm at cruise, I need to know at what point I need to begin my descent if the controller has not already descended me. Or if they start to try, if they give me a pilot's discretion descent prior to when I want to descend, I need to know how far out I need to begin to descend in order to be at that altitude when I get to the airport. I don't want to be stuck high, and I don't want to be low early, or I'm just burning fuel for no additional fuel rather for no reason. So in this instance, that means I have 21,000 feet to lose. If I desire a three degrees a three degree descent again, that means that I would have to begin my descent at least 70 miles prior to my destination if I want, again, want to use a three degree nose low attitude. If I accidentally miss my descent point because the controller had not asked me to descend yet and I would forgotten to request it, I would simply have to take my altitude to lose divided by, divided by my miles in which to lose it, and that would give me the necessary pitch at which I would have to pitch nose low in order to be at the new altitude in time. So for this instance, let's pretend that I'm, I need to have 12,000 feet to lose and I forgot to ask for a descent. Now I'm only 30 miles from where I need to be at my new altitude by. In this instance, we take 12,000 feet divided by our 30 miles, and that gives us 400, not a, sorry, 400 feet per nautical mile that we have to lose that in, which corresponds to 4 degrees nose low. If we're traveling at, say, 4 miles per minute, that means I would need at least 1,600 feet VSI in order to achieve that. As always, I thank you for joining me again today in our latest episode of All Things Aviation. hope that you found this interesting and helpful. If you have any questions, please submit them below or private message me. And as always, please like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.